Flight attendants rallied to demand they're paid for every minute they're in uniform. Mikisu Cree First Nation declares a state of emergency. More than a quarter of all CBC employees are temporary, and 17 people have died after an explosion in Pakistan's Swat region. Good morning. It's Wednesday, April 26th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. Flight attendants represented by CUPE held protests in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto and Montreal airports yesterday. Flight attendants work about 35 hours per month without compensation, says their union. The president of CUPE's airline division, Wesley Lasowski, told CBC News that the flight attendants are pretty much only paid when the plane is in motion. That means they're not working when you see them at the airport waiting to board, when they go to board to prepare the cabin, when they're fighting with your suitcases, when they're telling people, yes, you can use the bathroom while we're waiting, and when they're coordinating with gate workers over passengers. You can imagine that during a shift where flight attendants might have a series of flights that are less than two hours each, they easily find themselves unpaid long than they are paid. The CBC News article, which has no byline, reads like it was written by AI. I just added all of this information for you, but CBC leaves it out, using only a quote from Lasowski that paints their unpaid work with broad strokes. The protest wasn't directly related to bargaining. There's only one unit of QP workers, they work for Air Transat, that are currently in bargaining. But instead, the union was trying to draw attention to how bad flight attendant working conditions are. A WestJet rep said that they bargain rates of pay with the knowledge that workers are expected to do a lot of unpaid work. The representative said that this is an industry standard. This does, of course, beg the question, okay, why not just pay them for their work then, rather than trying to bargain a wage that kind of reflects the unpaid work that they do? We are possibly in for a few months of labor turbulence. As the travel industry recovers from COVID-related shocks, WestJet pilots voted overwhelmingly in favor of strike action last week, and they might find themselves striking just before the May long weekend. And on Monday, Omar Al-Gabra revealed his new set of rules for airline passenger rights. The rules zero in on flight delays, something that the airlines always claim is related to safety, but that anyone with half a brain and some aeroplan points know is more often than not a line. Anyway, Air Canada still owes me $1,600 for a delayed flight. Flight attendants are going to keep up the pressure, but as Air Canada continues to pull back routes in different parts of this country, all of this makes me wonder... Why don't we have a national airline? Why is this left to the private market to manage? Because when it is, of course, you get situations like, oh, you're not really working yet. The plane door hasn't been closed, which is literally how it works right now. Next to northern Alberta, where the Miccosu Cree First Nation has declared a state of emergency after a string of suicides and suicide attempts. Wallace Snowden for CBC News reports that leadership in the community are saying that the increasing mental health crisis requires emergency medical services. They have asked for help from Indigenous Services Canada and the Alberta Health Services. The community is located at Fort Shipwain and is only accessible by plane, boat or ice road. It's nearly 300 kilometers north of Fort McMurray. Exacerbating the mental health crisis is addiction. The band has tried to get a handle on the drug trade there by using a bylaw to allow Wood Buffalo RCMP to search homes for drugs. The community has a zero tolerance approach to manufacturing, selling or possessing illegal drugs. There are two First Nations communities who live at Fort Chip, the Miccosu Cree First Nation and the Athabascan Chippewayan First Nation, and the Fort Chippewayan Métis. About 798 people live in the community. What the article doesn't mention is how the tailings pond spill at the Curl Lake site, which is on the Athabasca River south of Fort Chip, has a massive impact on the community. It has poisoned the water at Fort Chip. The article also doesn't mention that the last residential school in the area shut down in 1974. There is an excellent feature in the Narwhal from about a week ago by Drew Anderson that dives deep into the environmental impact of decades of dams and mining projects on the people of Fort Chip. 
and the land and the animals. I highly recommend that you find it. As I said, Drew Anderson at the Narwhal. One of the impacts of oil extraction is that Fort Chip has higher rates of cancers. These are all connected to a widespread mental health crisis and probably warranted a mention in this article. Next to a feature in the review of journalism by Aloysius Wong about, well, a lot of people whose names I mentioned on this podcast. The state of permanent jobs at the CBC these days is not great. And Wong's feature takes a deep dive into just how many temp workers that the CBC relies on to do, well, everything. Wong reports that CBC employs more than 2,000 temporary and contract workers. This represents about a quarter of all CBC employees. As temps, there is no guarantee that their work will translate into a full-time job. They don't get pensions or health benefits, and they're easy to get rid of. Temps do pay union dues and are members of the union. And so Wong tells the story of how they organize to get representation specifically on the union's board. As temporary workers, they not only have less formal support to do their jobs, they also become more vulnerable to abuse. A keen journalist who is strung along on contracts and told that they're special because they've got a coveted dream job is less likely to make waves. Wong tells the story of one temp who had her story stolen by a colleague, a story that she had published six months previous. Her colleague had just put his own byline on the story. It's a really, I mean, wild. She tried to get the issue addressed by management, but a manager brushed her off. I suggest you check the feature out. It gives a glimpse into some of the problems behind the headlines that you read. When you hear me criticize a story written by someone at the CBC or by CBC News with no byline, know that there are probably way more problems percolating behind the scenes than we can even tell in the way that the stories are written. This is cancerous for journalism. And the CBC is one of the very few stable national media companies. For them to rely on temp and contract workers so much is unacceptable. It waters down the quality of the journalism. And, you know, honestly, I know a lot of people who have worked CBC contracts and as temps, and it has just driven them into the ground. It's it's not acceptable and it's really bad for journalism. And finally, the BBC is reporting that at least 17 people have been killed in two explosions in northwest Pakistan in the Swat Valley. The explosion happened at a counterterrorism office and officials are saying that it was the result of an electrical fault igniting ammunition at the center. The Pakistani Taliban has undertaken several attacks that targeted security forces in that region, but they have not claimed responsibility for this explosion. Most of the dead are police officers, though four are civilians, reports the BBC. More than 50 people were injured as the explosion brought down several buildings. Those are your headlines for Wednesday, April 26th. I'm Nora, and I hope you have a good day.